It's Thursday, January 26th. It's shop out. Shut the fuck God up. God damn it. <laughs> uh, okay. It's Thursday, January 26th. It's Chapo. Matt is on the road today, so fuck it. We're doing a TV episode. It's me, Felix, and joining us once again, our most requested uh, repeat guest, Catherine Krieger. Well, you know, vote vote with your comments, people. Thank you. It's good to so, be here. In case you haven't figured it out today, uh, we're doing a, a TV episode um, about a shared obsession of Felix, Catherine, and myself. I'll just begin by saying this. In the criminal justice system, sexually based offenses are considered especially heinous. In New York City, the dedicated detectives who investigate these vicious felonies are members of an elite squad known as the Special Victims Unit. These are their stories. Dun dun. Uh, this is, okay, just as a way of prefacing this, I, th I think it's worth stating that Law & Order Special Victims Unit is the longest running hour drama on primetime television in American history. And I think it goes a long way towards, uh, I don't know, explicating why this country is so uh, obsessed and hysterical about sex crimes and grooming and rape and all that stuff. It's the thing is, Dick Wolf cracked the code with this one. Law and order, pretty good. But the thing is about most <laughs> felony victims... There's not enough rape. They don't no. have that same razzle-dazzle <laughs> as the special victims. Yeah. That's right I, there in the name. They're special. I have... to. To give you an insight on how long this has been going on and how good he cracked the code, even with people who should, like, kind of know better and do know better, I remember driving home with my family. This has to have been, like, 20 years ago, driving home from our grandmother's house in the suburbs and my family talking about how, like, you know, these shows like SVU and CSI, they, they, they reinforce people's faith in the system and they convince people to be scared all the time. And then not even 10 minutes later... Um, my my parents talked about an NPR report they heard, where it was like, yeah, these girls in the suburbs are getting sexed into the bloods, <laughs> <laughs> it's, and it's like because it's it's, it's like I, I've thought about this show a lot, and I thought about you know the various forms it's taken because you know we're covering like sort of a middle era of the show, but if you watch like this show before 2011, 2010, about it's like, oh, yeah, Stabler is going to fucking break the suspect's nose. And the, uh, Alexander Cabot is going to charge the fucking defendant or going to charge the rape victim with being a bitch. So she has to testify. <laughs> and then it like slowly over time, you get to what it is today where it's like Finn Tutuola, Ice-T's character will be like, pansexuals are a part of the NYPD, just like they're a part of society. <laughs> and it's, 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 this, it's this genius creation that can take all forms and take on all people's fears, but it's also aspirational more than it is anything. I think that, like, despite cops pulling high and, like, all the fracas over, like, def defund the police and everything, I think people know for the most part that, cops aren't really like Stabler or Benson or Tutuola or anything. They know that most prosecutors aren't, aren't like Cabot. They're not inventive or compassionate or brave or selfless, but it would be really nice if they were. And I feel yeah. like a lot of the success of the show is like wishing that this was real life. And I also think like my, my origin story with uh, SVU is that I, I used to watch it. We had a cabin in the Northwoods of Wisconsin that we would go to every weekend of my entire childhood. I fucking hated it because I just wanted to stay home and hang out with my friends. And we only had one channel. And every Friday night, it was Law & Order SVU on NBC, which was the only channel. So I watched it every Friday and Saturday night with my entire family. Um, so it carved a lot of grooves in my brain in terms of like, um, like learning what a blowjob is, um, <laughs> only in the context of like a priest and like a little boy or something. <laughs> uh, Catherine thought blowjobs were crimes until she was, you know. I still do, yeah. actually. <laughs> I still do, <laughs> fellas. Um, and yeah, so and I, you know, it's good that you have a, a woman on this episode because I also think that like you know, it's carved a lot of grooves in a lot of American women's brains in the way that it's it's wish casting like. Every woman who is, uh, you know, a victim or a survivor of sexual assault hopes that Olivia takes their case. But, you know, more like, I don't know. Craigan. Uh, Craigan. They're talking to Craigan. Yeah. Oh, hey, yeah. hey, Craigan, <laughs> Craigan. On if Craigan still drank. Like, Craigan's dude, Craigan is nicer than, like, any cop that exists. He's yeah, like, like, like Harvey Keitel. Yeah, Cra tennis. exactly. 
Kragen is like probably the most unrealistic character on the show because he's like was born in like 1951 and he's like <laughs> SVU who protects M, M to F's, F to M switch, <laughs> switches, tops, bottoms. Like he just, he knows all the terminology. He's super sweet. He's just a kind, sober man. But um, yeah, it's, it, it is, I, I, I think you're right. Like every, every woman does wish if Olivia was real. And I think every man kind of wishes that a little bit. Every ally. Well, yeah. I mean, look, Lone Order SVU, it's a show it's a show about men and women, really, and it's it, it's good television for for guys and gals alike. But <laughs> I, I I think like it, it, it's all summed up in the preamble, right? In the criminal justice system, sexually based offenses are considered especially heinous. It's like they're telling you right off the bat that um, sex crimes are like especially enthralling and thrilling to, to yeah. hear about because like every episode, you're going to get a cold open. You're going to find a body with its eyes gouged out on a little league field when someone's walking their dog and there's going to be a victim, a special victim, and then there's going to be a sicko. And the sicko is going to get punished by the end of an hour of television. I love, I love the preamble so much because it frames it like... Oh, only in the criminal justice system are like sex crimes considered especially heinous. Yeah, like in in the broad in broader society, it's just like, well, yeah, that shit happens. You know, you're going to find like uh, my conception of New York City before I moved here was just like if you ever go to Central Park or you know you take out your trash in the meatpacking district or something, like you will find a dead hooker in the bushes. That's what I love about um. After about season 14, they got a little more artsy with their opens and they show things from the perspective of the victim more. But it used to be it would be like, you know, scenes from New York. It would be like two bodega workers talking like, you see the Knicks last night? They freaking stink. I don't <laughs> yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you know what else stinks? Something's outside. Oh, my God. Someone threw away a baby. <laughs> it, it, like, it'll be like, see, like, to, like Taurus or Taurus or like real New Yorkers or like line workers stumbling on a body. And Stabler and Benson show up on the scene and they'll be like, well, like, it's a dead body. Why did you call us? And then a, a, a an Emmy or uh, their corner. The Maritini's will pop out. character will show up. Yeah, she'll like, be like, "By the way, they won't believe the, the fluids yeah, that leaked yeah, out." Yeah, um, this is the most <laughs> raped man we've ever seen. <laughs> and then Benson, uh, then Stabler will say something like, "Talk about your Saturday nights." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the little one-liners that they do sometimes yeah. when they transition into the the theme. That's the stinger. Every every cold open has to have a stinger that goes right into the. The theme song and yeah. the opening credits. Yeah, th this baby, this baby had double AIDS, and then Stabler's <laughs> like, "Looks like Baby Einstein wouldn't even help." <laughs> it's um, like he's he's never like that other time. Like he's like deathly serious all other times. So why does he do that when they find the body? Uh, and, and I'll just say like, okay, so like for, for today's episode, like we have each selected an episode of SVU, and we're gonna give you a tour of like th I think three episodes that. Uh, v very neatly summarized the show, but I'll just say, uh, if just, you if you happen to be unfamiliar, <laughs> yeah, if you happen yeah, to be unfamiliar yeah. with the show, if you, if you were if you were literally born yesterday, and <laughs> most of our listeners have there they have not been alive when SVU was not on television. Your entire life has been bracketed by detectives Benson and Stabler. And look, I I, I think like there's no way to talk about this show without getting away from the fact that like. The, the appeal of the show is in the period disgusting crimes that are uh, explicated on the show and how over the top they go. Cause like uh, we, we can, we can get into it, but like, it's never, it's like, it's, it's it, they'll arrest one pedophile and then they're just like, <laughs> this pedophile is the king of all pedophiles. He has access to the, he's the king. Of, he's king of the pedophile <laughs> club. Uh, and he's got yeah. all of their addresses. <laughs> Like, you know, you can't just have like a, oh, like man rapes woman episode. Like, it's always got to be like, um, oh, and there's a baby um, down the well. And the baby is also, um, you know, has been, you know, uh, uh, interfered traf with. Yeah, <laughs> trafficked. Yeah. Trafficked, interfered with. Every, whenever there is like a singular rape victim, they have to up the ante so much. Like, I remember there's one episode where it's just like, it's over a single rape and there's a single witness who's like being threatened with deportation. And to do, because they're like, this isn't enough. They make it so that the rape victim, A, in classic, like, middle period SVU fashion, they're like, okay, she's kind of a bitch. She has bitch woman disorder, just like Stabler's <laughs> daughter. And then, and then, like, even though she's totally coherent and fine for most of the episode, they're like, her condition's taking a turn for the worse. She has three days to live. 
<laughs> she, has to, she has to make her and, and and like her dying in three days like redeems her because the entire episode before that she's like you chased away my boyfriend you're a bitch olivia and then when they're like you have three days to live she's like okay i'm going to testify against this man so he can no longer hurt women like the, yeah. the way this show treats women is like some awful crime has to happen to them so they can be purified that's why like olivia is like the most important character on the show. She's like a martyr figure. She has, I mean, the SVU universe's version of a virgin birth, which is her bitch mom got raped, and <laughs> creating the well, perfect she, cop. You know, as the show goes on, she also has her own virgin birth, which is I don't know, I, I don't really remember the particulars if her womb is barren or what, or if she's just you know, she just does the job all the time. Yeah. But she she eventually you know adopts a child. That was, you know, I don't know how the child surfaced in the commission of a crime. Um, he was, he was a Johnny this- Drake, Johnny Drake's sex trafficking gang. Uh, he got one of the girls <laughs> pregnant, Ellie, and um, uh, Olivia adopted the kid, Noah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, Noah is bisexual now, I've heard, even yeah, though Noah, Noah is like nine years old. <laughs> Noah is the youngest uh, out main character on Law and Order SVU. And also um, the problem of Johnny Drake being in federal prison for having a, a sex trafficking ring, it was solved when Detective Amaro, their ill-fated stabler replacement, whose main characteristic was being pissed off, killed Johnny <laughs> Drake in self-defense in a paternity hearing. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. Yeah, this really gets into how thorny the show is. Well, before we get into the uh, the episodes themselves, I think we should just give a, a, a brief uh, a brief overview of the characters that populate New York City's Special Victims Unit. Obviously, the two main characters, like the 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 the, the North Stars of the, the show, the emotional core of yeah, the, the show. Yeah, the emotional core of the show is the relationship between uh, Detective Olivia Benson, played by uh, nepotism baby Mariska Hargitay. Look it up, um, and Chris Maloney. And they're, they're, they're sort of like, they, they, they represent the male and female perspective on the show because, I don't know, like Stabler is a, a brooding Catholic and who's like wants to be a good dad. But he is, loves doing police brutality. He wants to be a good dad, but his, 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 his bitch wife wants to leave him. His daughters are out of control. You know, he's like, he, he plays down the law in the streets, but he should honestly do it more um, in his own household. Uh, you got Olivia Benson, who, like you said, Felix, is sort of like a martyr for every woman who's ever been assaulted. She is the the she she always she identifies with the victim. She's like she gets them out of their shells. She gets a, he earns their trust. She is like she's the emotional center of the show. Then you've got um, the comic relief uh, <laughs> on a show about um, child abuse and rape. Uh, play uh, Finn Tutuolo, played by Ice T, and uh, Detective John Munch, played by Richard Belzer. They're sort of like the you know, like they're they're all you know the duo. Like there's the straight man, uh, Ice T is the straight man, and Munch is always talking to his his conspiracy nonsense. Munch, I, I, rewatching the show, I'm sort of like fascinated by how little they use Munch. Like for, yeah, he never he never gets like solo episodes at all. Whereas the rest of them all kind of get like, oh, it's an Olivia episode. Like Munch exists like when they're like, okay, like to track down this perp, like we gotta like hack into the cell phones of every person in the five boroughs, and then yeah. Munch will just be like, sounds like Big Brother to me. <laughs> Munch yeah. is the like, only shut one. Shut up, Munch. He's the only one who knows what the dark web is. He's never accessed it, but he knows he knows that it exists. Yeah, there, there's entire like episode arcs and multi like going over seasons that follow like Tutolo's family and all this shit and with munch the only insight we get is like oh he's been married to a lot of crazy women but don't worry they're not <laughs> they don't have like the bad crazy woman disease they're just singularly crazy women because they like talking about the jfk assassination <laughs> then you've got uh the captain of the svu uh Cragen, played by dan florek you know he's just sort of the the straight the, man the old the old time cop who's like you know always warning them that like you know you're over the line and they're like damn it like the, the my the, office <laughs> now <laughs> yeah, my yeah, office yeah. now Whenever, whenever, whenever it's like, they're like, um, we've that we found a therapist who tries to cure his, his, uh, patients by raping them. <laughs> it's Dan Florek's job. It's always Dan Florek's job to go like, do you know that that therapist is the mayor's brother-in-law and he gave him a medal today? You have to do this quietly. <laughs> yeah, he provides like some some like vague politics um, and some, you know, just like a little bit of exposition for the for the viewing public about like, hey, you probably didn't know this. Um, and then you got uh, the, the ADAs, which are usually like a very sexy lady, either played by Stephanie March or Diane Neal, Cabot and Novak are the two main ones. But like 
Uh, their job is to show up usually halfway through an episode when the trial phase of the story begins to be like, you're telling me I have to put this victim in jail because her baby testified against her or something like that. There's always <laughs> yeah, some yeah. legal or moral dilemma that she they're, always, like, she they're always... being forced to prosecute a victim for some reason or I, I don't know. Like, she also but... always really harsh as their mellows, particularly stablers, because she'll be like, oh, um, actually, it's hard for me to get a conviction based on like, you know, no evidence um, and, you know, like a, a bad confession. It's like, look at the guy. He says he's guilty, and he's like, that won't ha- that that won't stand up in court, Elliot. Um, and then you got like sort of the the. There's always a defense attorney that there's a rotating cast of like uh, sleazy defense attorneys who either defend the rich or the indigent, depending on you know who they get and what their hair looks uh, like. Then you got um, the uh, the medical examiner played by Tamara Tooney, who's like you know she's she's the one who shows up to be like. This is the, these are the most this is the most fluids I've ever seen in a body, um, and then BD Wong, who's like the the psychiatrist who comes in to just be like FBI profiler. Yeah, he's the FBI profiler and expert on sex crimes. So like he's always like sort of looking into an interrogation room and being like, it's all about power with him. And they're like, okay, thanks, thanks for that one. I think he had a difficult relationship with his mother. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There will be a guy who's cut off thirty seven women's heads, <laughs> and he'll be like. Actually, he has a disease where he thinks that every person he meets is an action figure. <laughs> All right, so just by way of that that, that preamble, these are the these are the detectives who investigate these vicious felonies. Uh, let's go into the episode uh, that I have chosen. It is season eleven, episode five, Hardwired. Uh, this first aired in two thousand nine, I believe, and I think this is a this is a good. Like if you're if you're just being introduced to Law and Order SVU, th- th- this is a good like template episode to uh, get you started on it. So I would just like to describe for you like okay, this is the cold open. So uh, it's it's a, a private school is uh, is getting out, and there's a mother uh, waiting in her car to pick up her kids, and then another mother rear ends her car, like goes over to the window and starts hitting her. Like a, a fight breaks out. The other mother is played by guest star of the week. Another very important part about SVU, which we'll get into. The sheer quality and quantity of their guest stars over their 21 season run is quite unparalleled. The guest star, or one of the guest stars in this episode, is played by Rosie Perez. Rosie Perez is the mother attacking another mother as school gets out. And then it becomes clear that uh, Rosie Perez is attacking the mother because her, like uh, the, the, the woman she's attacking, her kid accused her son of molesting him. So uh, Elliot and Olivia show up, and I believe Elliot uh, gets kicked in the nuts by Rosie Perez. And the stinger going into the opening credits is Elliot goes, now I know why they call them special victims. <laughs> it's just like, doesn't, it doesn't even, even make sense. sense. It doesn't even yeah. make sense. Yeah. It, it, like no other show would dare do that after like something as sordid as like a child molesting another child. So go into the opening credits. Uh, then we get into the, the first segment. So obviously Olivia and Elliot are got to talk to the mom uh, who was attacked. And she says that uh, Rosie Perez's son, a kid named Corey, uh, they had him over for a sleepover. And when she was checking in on the boys, she found them engaged in nude wrestling. Um, Her son denies it and says they were just playing around. It was just wrestling. So then... um, Oh, sorry. That's all. Olivia was uh, de- debriefing the, uh, the the mother who got hit with the car. Stabler is in the other the other box, uh, talking to uh, Rosie Perez and her son, the one who's been accused of molesting this other kid. And he's sort of like, uh, he says, you know, was it your idea to to wrestle naked? And uh, Corey, <laughs> the son, says, games are more fun when you're naked. And then he's like, do you play naked games with uh, with other kids? And it turns out this kid Corey has been playing naked games with a lot of kids. <laughs> <laughs> He's been playing naked yeah. games. Buckle, buckle in, buckle in. And Rosie Perez is like freaking out. She has no idea what's going on. They go out behind the uh, one-way mirror, two-way mirror, sorry. And B.D. Wong is there, and they're like, "What do you make of this? Is this just sexual experimentation or a sign that the kid was molested?" B.D. Wong goes, "He's engaging in mastery play." <laughs> <laughs> <Just one of> the, <laughs> this is the expertise he's bringing. Um, so they decide that they're not going to charge the kid, um, but they still have to charge his mom for uh, assaulting another mother. And but of course, Cragen uses this as a pretext to like separate the mother from her son, take the son to a hospital to get him checked out. 
do do like a run run a rape kit on the sun to see what's going on. Incredible, incredible how often they love to separate parents from kids on this show. Although I will say that I think this show, and I've said this to Will as we've watched it before, I think this show uh, in, you know, the defendants, like they demonstrate a mastery of their civil rights that I don't think most people in real life have. You know, like they'll say like, oh, well, I have a right not to be, uh, or, you know, I have a right to be there when my kid is being questioned. You know, things like that, Um, which, yeah, you know, uh, except for Jay-Z, um, we're not reminded of our civil rights very often. <laughs> so they take uh, they take Corey to the hospital and they're like, they, they, they still don't know what's going on with this kid. So uh, they um, ex- they examine him and find out that he has chlamydia. So <laughs> we're off to, off, to, <laughs> off to a great start on this show. Um, and then, of course, and then, uh, uh, B.D. Wong's character, uh, Dr. Wong. Uh, they, they, they find out about uh, his, uh, that he received a massage from his wrestling coach, okay? And uh, Corey says, um, a lot of the guys get rubbed downs from him. After a meet, he has a pizza party at his house, and sometimes he gives us massages. So it's like, okay, Re- wrestling coach massaging kids. Then they find out that um, he's basically changed his name after moving from Baltimore <laughs> after serving time for uh, raping a child and has managed to get a job as a wrestling coach. This seems like an open and shut case. Uh, Felix, when I watched this, and he said he was a, uh, <laughs> said he was from Baltimore. All I could think about was Stav's joke about the uncle who molested uh, the kid who didn't finish the obstacle course at Discovery <laughs> Zone. <laughs> I, I would have loved that if they had to bring in Dundalk Guy as a witness. <laughs> that was the entire episode. Just enticing him with chicken bosses to testify. <laughs> I don't uh, so like, talk about I, I don't want to talk about it. It's like traumatic. Olivia <laughs> Olivia Benson having to talk to like her toughest victim yet. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. He said he was gonna earn, 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 earn. <laughs> he said he was gonna get me tickets for the Ravens game. What was I supposed to do? <laughs> uh, so, like, this is very important, though. They have to introduce the first wrong suspect, right? It's like, okay, yeah, this guy's a child rapist who's gotten a job teaching kids wrestling at a private <laughs> yeah. school. We but, let that one through, but yeah, but, but, that, but turns out that guy's not that bad. Well, I mean, at least not, <laughs> at least not as bad. He's as, not the baddie we're looking for. Yeah, he's right. a baddie. So. Uh, he then, hasn't raped a child yet. Well, I mean, not well in, not in his new position. Well, yeah. Uh, what's he gonna do? Run for for the U.S. House of Representatives, <laughs> Oaks? <laughs> so okay, and then uh, then they're like, okay, well, uh, this guy's alibi checks out. Uh, the, the kid is adamantly saying that it wasn't his wrestling coach who uh, abused him. Um, so then we meet. Then we can see the home life of Corey and Rosie Perez, and we're introduced to. The stepfather, played by uh, Officer Presbo from The Wire. I, I forget his name. I'll just call him Presbo from The Wire. And you thought a shooting step- a kid's eye was bad. <laughs> <laughs> and once they introduce this guy, you're like, well, the, the, the gig is up here. This guy is ad- obviously the, the molesting. Jig. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. The jig is the up? The jig is up? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. The yeah, jig- yeah. <laughs> This guy's obviously molesting his stepson, and it's like you know Rosie Perez and her her son. Like uh, she was in abusive relationships, she was addicted to drugs, she was like living on the streets. They were went they through were, the like the shelter. Yeah, system. they were living in a shelter, and then like he was volunteering at like a soup kitchen, which is like you know always a bad sign. That's a big red flag if you got a guy volunteering to help other people. Yeah, He's that's usually... why that's why Will and I don't do it. <laughs> um, we want to stay away from the the sicko volunteers. Yeah. Um, and he's using it to, to gain access to vulnerable women. And, um, and their children, and uh, so uh, like Elliot cottons to this, and like you know, like uh, the the stepfather is obviously very much coaching the son. He's like, now it was your wrestling coach who molested you, right? And the kid's like, oh, I don't want to talk about it. And Elliot understands what's going on there, so he's like, listen, buddy, I'm gonna park outside of your house and stay there around the clock in case this kid needs help or whatever. Which brings us to segment two after the first commercial break. Elliot is on a stakeout, and uh, we, we get this line from, uh, from Benson. And they're, like, talking about this guy and why he's, why he's sus. And Olivia goes, it's the perfect family for a pedophile. Marry mom and get unlimited access to Corey. <laughs> <laughs> watching, watching Chris's face through this, I'm, I'm sorry there's no video feed. <laughs> Just cringing upon cringing. That's what this show is. That's yeah, what this I- show is. 
I, I I watched this show with a romantic partner, and she said, I'm scared of you because you've seen so many episodes of this. I think you're scary because you watch this show to go to sleep. <laughs> Felix, Felix, romantic partner, reveal. <laughs> I've seen maybe like four total episodes of SVU, so I I know the vibe. But the thing is, the thing that you're getting at here, that describing any discrete moment of SVU, even though it is objectively uh, the the most normal TV show of all time, sounds completely insane. Yes. It, yeah. It's really yeah, it sounds crazy. Like the it's most really crazy. Propaganda you could possibly imagine. Yeah, like the idea that this is normal TV for Americans. I know, and it's, this just, is... it's just like, oh, unlimited access to Corey. <laughs> and all of us sitting at home on our couches are just like, being like, yes, oh, that yeah. would be a perfect family for yeah, a kind of Yeah, I gotta yeah. gather my family around <laughs> to watch this. No, I, I, if we can leave you from anything from this show, that, like this is objectively not normal. That this show is the most popular, longest-running TV show in, in American history. So uh, they know what's going on in this family. So uh, they say Olivia has a go at Rosie Perez, you know, woman to woman, to tell her what's going on. And like as she describes what's happening, Rosie Perez has like a usual suspect style fucking re- realization that. Uh, <laughs> Her husband has been raping her child for years. And they confront Corey at school and tell him it's okay to talk to the police. Now, I'd like to Wrong. talk I'd like to talk about, about this scene. We're like, so SVU is a show that deals in large part with the as they say, the uniquely heinous and awful uh aspect of, of child abuse of any kind. And, you know, that that that's certainly true. But I will say it makes me question like how seriously they take the message of the show that this is something Catherine and I have talked about watching the show as long as we have. The number of child actors that this show has basically abused by making them do take after take of a scene where they have to be like tears in their eyes, be like, and then he said we would have to touch our wieners together. And it's just like I have the the parents of this child actor, the writers and producers of this show. Like it it, it just it makes me feel in some respect uh, the acting performances that they require out of these child victims is it, in itself a kind of abuse. Imagine making your kid do that and then they don't get the part. <laughs> like imagine <laughs> like imagine oh. uh, imagine like corralling your kid and like stick and carrot, bribing them with snacks, threatening them with early bedtime to say the line like, he made me he made me stick my butt open and put his hand in it. <laughs> and then you don't hear anything for four weeks. And then eventually you get a form letter saying they went with someone else. I mean, you if, have to if feel like, like the, the new, worst parent ever. If the I new hope. season of Nathan for you taught us anything, it's that um child actors really take this stuff to heart. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, seriously. Um, yeah, that kid auditioning goes home and is like, oh, maybe this happens. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. That's well, my I mean, medical like, yeah, opinion. When you're four, how could you tell the difference? Like, <laughs> Jesus Yeah, really. Christ. So, um, uh, so they, they, they are, like, uh, you know, uh, Corey, uh, you know, says what's been going on at home. Uh, they are, arrest the ste- stepfather. You know, there's the classic law and order scene of they cut to the, uh, the, the, the scale, the creep, the sicko. They cut to his, like, place of work. Stabler barges in. They're like, he's like, you can't, you can't harass. This is harassment. And then they're like, you know, you'll be getting harassed in prison. And, and also the prison rape jokes on this show really, really go over the top. Yeah. Well, they're used as, they're used as threats. Yeah. You know, which I guess, yeah, um, the, the joke is kind of inherent. But yeah, the notion that like, because these guys are top tier sickos, you know, just like being, um, and you know, a spoiler alert, but the 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 bad, the ultimate bad guy in this episode is going to get thirty two hundred years in prison. The notion that like that's not a sufficient punishment. Um, he also has to be repeatedly raped in prison is is really um, you know a compass for where the show's morality is at or um, sense of justice. I like that you um you alluded to the ultimate bad guy in the episode, which is not even the guy <laughs> raping his stepson. Nope. No, no. A, 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 a SVU episodes work almost like Dark Souls worlds where there's, <laughs> there's like a tutorial sicko where it's like, oh, that's easy. Yes, you just, yes, yeah, yes. You're like, oh, oh, that's easy. You just check the sex offender registry and see if someone changed their name. Then you have like the first like real boss and that's like, yeah, the, the um, respectable white collar rapist or pedophile. And then, like, you know, the world boss, the guy who you can transpose their soul to get, like, a pedophile sword. 
after you after you <laughs> them. And that's like that's like that that'll be like the guy that'll be a guy who's like, oh uh, yeah, I'm the head of like, you know, um the rotary club for pedophiles <laughs> for the entire East Coast. Well, uh, well, that, well, that is where this episode goes because you know this is like this is the, in, in the in the like the 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 first like the second commercial segment. Uh, Corey has um, talked to the cops. He has um, you know finally uh, you know co- you know been able to admit of uh, the terrible abuse that's been happening to him in the home. They arrest the stepfather, and Benson says, "Corey, it's over. My partner arrested <laughs> Thomas. Everything's." fine he's playing his psp uh she explains to rosie perez that they can keep their apartment they'll take it out of the no, Thomas's there's name. at least two commercial breaks left <laughs> everything is going to be fine and the worst <laughs> wor- oh, sorry but um one of the worst lines in svu history um after benson's like we're gonna clean out his bank accounts rosie perez goes damn girl you got a little bit of gangster in you yeah i, I, wrote, <laughs> yeah, I wrote that down that was great that was great so uh, so so Elliot's got uh, the stepfather, Officer Presbo, um, in the box, and he's like, you know, we got your laptop. You're going away. Like, he says, you're going to have a 300-pound daddy in prison. We got lots of photos <laughs> of you doing all this sick shit on your laptop. So, aha, uh-huh. here's where it gets interesting. The perp is like, well, you've got me dead to rights, but I've got something to offer in trade. And that offer is King pedophile. I, I will help you arrest the president of the Pedophilia Association of America, which is a like a guy who runs a civil rights organization for pedophiles, which becomes like the basically the plot of this episode. And it's something that they always do with uh, like child sex offense or, you know, uh, with pedophiles on the show is that when they're always like, how could you do what you do? And like the pedophile will always bring up this idea that like, well, actually uh, the DSM considered homosexuality a mental illness until the seventies. So like, this is just a, a normal sexual orientation and boy, oh boy, that's where this show yeah, goes. Yeah. The pedophiles talk about it. Like it's ethical non-monogamy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, the, the president of uh, <laughs> the, the rotary club of pedophiles <laughs> of the East coast of the United States is coming over to his house for dinner. That night, in but, which they are going to, he is going to allow him access to the pedophile club and like transfer something. I don't know. Th- this part was like a, a, a bit uh, glossed over. He's like, I have a flash drive with the names of five thousand pedophiles in my club. The and names gonna- and and like the child porn that they were forced to make in order to be, you know, child yeah. porned in to the yeah. To the he's club. like, yeah, it's, it's like, like it's really almost bad like opsec. Yeah, it's like it's like a Happy Days episode premise almost. Like, oh, the head of the the regional head of the company is coming over <laughs> to like over for dinner. <laughs> I don't yeah. have anything to serve. What are we gonna make him? And then yeah, then the wife like the meatloaf uh, the blows roast up, is burned, blows yeah. up in the in the oven or something. So wait, uh, like, I, I, wait, what, what, steamed kids? Oh, it's a regional <laughs> term. It's from upstate. <laughs> so okay I, th- th- what happens next is the reason that i selected this episode to talk about because it is literally like uh, something that can only happen on this team it- it's just it is so fucking funny so basically remember when they told Corey that everything was okay uh elliot's like we can't blow this opportunity to arrest five thousand pedophiles they're like well what are we gonna do and they're like aha they talked to ada stephanie marsh the, what they're going to do oh. is send um, special victim Corey back into the apartment with his abusive stepfather and to meet with another pedophile. They're going to send a victim of pedophilia undercover to entice out a pedophile. And like this is one of the most insane things I've ever seen on a show. They're like, and then Corey, they're like, they're like, are you sure we can put this kid in that much danger? And then Corey's like, if it'll help other kids, it's I want to do it. So, like, somehow the ADA and New York City Police Department, like, they just signed off on idea. this idea of just letting a child victim go undercover to entice a rapist it's, out. It's literally like um, the pedophile in space. Like, this is actually <laughs> this is the, the, the first, our first and best idea. This is exactly what we wanted to happen. Yeah. yeah the, by the way, I would say the average child victim they make go undercover or, like, testify or do anything is on average 30% more compliant than the than the usual like adult woman victim you know oh yeah the the adult women victims are unruly they don't trust the cops they probably like stand by their their boyfriend or something but the kids the kids are very um you know community minded and like well if it'll help other kids yeah 
See, the thing is not, not, I mean, they're all special, but it's very clear in the show that some victims are just, they, they don't want to help themselves. You know, you know? Yeah. as my mother always said, God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> um, the, the cops help those who go undercover for other kids. Uh, you know, so which, which brings us to segment three and enter the, the final boss of this episode. <laughs> yes, there, this is, there's a second stage to this sicko fight. Fuck. And that the, the final boss is played by, uh, you know, one of my favorite TV character actors, Garrett Dillahunt, who you awesome. might remember as the psychotic geologist and rapist from uh, HBO's Deadwood. Uh, so, you know, th th he's, he's a great choice if you want a villain on a TV show. So they like they set up the apartment with like closed circuit cameras and they're like they're watching it from the other room. And like so like the mother and her son now have to have a nice normal dinner with two pedophiles. <laughs> who are trying, one of whom is trying to Problem? buy buy her son. <laughs> and they're like, you just got to keep it together, lady. This is an unstable woman who's been charged with assault twice since this episode started. And they're about to put her with a knife in a room with uh, the man who had been raping her son and another man who wants to buy her son. Uh, so wouldn't you believe it? Uh, they, they hand over the flash drive and they make the bust, but not before Rosie Perez stabs her uh, soon-to-be ex-husband. And then once again, it's like, they should not have let that many sharp objects in the room of, <laughs> of this. Yeah. Of, Felix, Felix, one of our other favorite recurring motifs, which this is kind of adjacent to, is that like um, they'll be walking out like, you know, some scumbag who's not the perp or something, like walking them out of the police station after questioning. And then they always like intersect at the elevators with like the, the dead kid's parents or something. And it like, you know, becomes like a combustible situation. There's like a fight or something. And it's like, God, we got to figure out a way for this to stop happening. <laughs> and, uh, over the course of the show, at least 50 people have been shot to death in the SVU in the precinct. All precinct. Yeah, so, like we've got to stop letting people bring guns in here. <laughs> it's like like the SVU precinct is probably the least secure building in New York. You could walk in there with a fucking bazooka. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip to the end here because like basically it becomes the trial part of the episode, and uh, the defense attorney on this episode, played by Jerry Ryan, who you might remember as uh, Seven of Nine from Star Trek Voyager, and also the uh, former wife of the disgraced Illinois politician whose uh, sexcapades with her paved the way for Barack Obama to become uh, a little, a little our prescient that president. she was in yeah. the sex crime show. Um, so basically, like uh, the the trial segment of the show, she tries like. Like, it, it, again, totally ludicrous. She uh, plans to plead not guilty based on uh, the defendant's civil rights and tries to make a court case out of the idea that um, adult sexual relationships with children are normal and harmless. And the judge just simply goes, I'll allow it. <laughs> Which is like, that's another my favorite trope of mine is like the judge and anything where they just go, I'll allow it. And uh, like the, the big climax of the show is... Um, that the defense attorney has Rosie Perez on the stand and is like trying to make her out to look like a bad mother. And, and like uh, it, she, Rosie Perez breaks down and goes, that monster raped my son for t every night for two years. And then Jerry Ryan goes, you have a lot of blame for everyone but yourself. <laughs> 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 and the climax of the show is that uh, Corey, the child, like interrupts the trial to just be like, she's a good mom. I love her, and that man abused me. He's bad. And, well, like, and B.D. Wong going totally <laughs> off the cuff because, you know, he's like, well, it offends my humanity as a gay man to have, and you a know, psychiatrist. Um, to, you know, have, have homosexuality compared to pedophilia, DSM, blah, blah, blah. He brings the kid in for this, like, unruly thing, which the idea that, like, it didn't immediately result in a mistrial, this kid just yeah. screaming in open court, like, he raped me. Um, so like, I'm instructing the jury to uh, forget everything about that uh, young we, boy's we, we emotional drawn, plea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, usually, usually, like, the judges on this show, there's a lot of, like, sicko lib judges who are, like, implied <laughs> to be holdover appointees from the 70s, where it's, like, the stuff they'll usually allow and declare mistrial over, it'll be like, um, actually, I'm ruling that... Uh, it's in the defendant's constitutional rights that he gets to live with his victim during the trial. <laughs> <laughs> but for some reason, this is just like, okay. So, I mean, like, you know, uh, justice is served at the end of every episode. You know, uh, Garrett Dillahunt gets 3,000 years in jail for his uh, child <laughs> rape empire. Oh, which were which were all hidden inside like the metadata of otherwise benign images. Yeah, seganography. Yeah. Is, yeah, that's, what he, that's what he's doing there. Um, but yeah, again... Just uh, for the uh, 
<laughs> for a judge allowing a pedophile to claim that it's his civil rights are being violated because his civil right to uh, have sex with children, th- for that and the scene where they send a victim of uh, child abuse undercover with their own abuser to entice uh, the, the, the king pedophile, uh, that's why I chose this episode because of how fucking unbelievable it was. But I thought that's a good, that's a good starter SVU episode. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Brag about molesting kids and men you caught, you all cry like the little bitches that you are. My organization promotes the protection of the true love between children and adults. Son of a bitch, I'm gonna fix you right now so you can't love any more kids. You can't intimidate me! Someday you and everyone else are gonna have to accept people like me. I'll accept you when you're dead. Leave me alone. You've got nothing on me. Oh, yeah? I got your flash drive. That's it? No porn? You sure? Just three cheesy pictures. Totally innocuous. This doesn't make sense. Why would O'Donnell give Banks these pictures? I didn't get it either, so I dug a little deeper and found computer code hidden in a pixel. I cracked it, opened a secret file, and found all these pictures. Pervert's pot of gold at the end of the digital rainbow. There's got to be a thousand pictures here. All right, Catherine. Okay. All right. So I'll I'll try and keep my my plot summary moving. So if you don't follow this, feel free to DM me on Twitter. Would love to discuss this at some length. I chose, you know, Will chose a pedophilia episode. Uh, I chose a bitch of a lady episode. Yes, an evil woman episode. Um, and and this episode, you know, just just hang with me because boy, is it really going places. Um, the episode opens with a lady. This is, by the way, this is season seven, episode two, Design. Yes. Um, and so the episode opens with a hot lady played by Estrella Warren um, about to throw herself off a building. Uh, and, you know, the, the dumb uniformed cops are like reading out of a book. They can't figure out how to talk her down. Um, she's pregnant. And then finally she yells she was raped. And so that's your bring in Olivia Benson moment. Olivia arrives on the scene. You know, she's got the right training. She's got hot cocoa. She talks this woman down off the ledge. Her name is April. She's already got a name for a baby. The baby's going to be named Sarah. Um, then our first cut, they go to April being examined in the hospital. And, you know, another recurring theme in this show is uh, uh, doctors, you know, just like refusing to do, doing things like refusing to do rape kits on um, patients who don't want them. Um, or, you know, just otherwise being inept to police matters. So the doctor is arguing she's not a danger to herself or others, so they can't hold her, you know, for more than 24 hours or whatever. Um, and Elliot, Catholic, is complaining that, uh, oh, the baby doesn't count. <laughs> yes. Um, so, yeah, a little a little pro-life moment from Elliot. Um, this, show, this show does venture into interesting things like that. Like, there's an ep- another episode where Cabot has to argue that, like, a dead baby has rights or something, you know, there's, there's, there's all kinds of stuff that, yeah. Um, they're always finding interesting legal conundrums. To, yeah. Uh, explore. Yeah. And then they're like, Oh, you know, this otherwise like liberal New York, powerful woman has to argue, you know, something that might seem like it's, you know, red state, um, evangelical hokum, but it's because of the law. Um, and actually, it's good for the victim. Uh, another interesting aspect of Law and Order SVU, and indeed the entire Law and Order series, is that like you know, so many of these stories are ripped from the headlines and meant to like touch on controversial issues that exist in our culture. But like all of those issues exist in New York City, and like I saw one the other day where there was like some sort of like quiverful evangelical family with like ten kids whose ministry was based in New York City. And it's just like, uh, yeah, that well, happens all the yeah. time. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, they, they also make Elliot the most reasonable, like, psycho Catholic ever. He's like, well, yeah. like, I'm fervently pro life and, like, anti euthanasia, except if, like, someone, there's no chance of someone, like, recovering or, uh, you know, if the mother was raped or, you know, she just doesn't want to have the kid or whatever. <laughs> yeah. like, they make them so eminently reasonable that I don't know why they even bothered with, like, the hardcore Catholic angle. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. It's the same, um, thing, with it's the, it's the same thing with Olivia's liberalism because it's, like, you can tell the writers sometimes are like, oh, we're going to make her too much of a bleeding heart and, like, alienate, like, the the you know part of the audience just wants to see the sickos punished so they have to give her scenes where she like corners a pedophile and like beats his ass right right absolutely um 
And as we'll see in this episode, uh, actually, Elliot takes the back seat and Olivia is kind of the chief antagonist to um, the victim who, um, as will, it turns out, as it turns out, is a much of a victim. Um, another law and order trope. OK, so she's in the hospital. Um, she's reluctant to tell Olivia, you know, the full story of being assaulted. She's she's really playing this, you know, oh, I don't even have my GED. I have no power. Um, the guy who assaulted me is is very powerful. Finally names him. His name, wonderful made-up name, is Barclay Pallister. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, it turns out Barclay Pallister um, is, you know, like a science guy um, whose who's big claim to fame and who's allowed him has allowed him to IPO, I guess, um, is that... He's found a way to flash freeze cadavers, um, so like, and like, like kind of like vaporize cadavers. <laughs> this is this is a great Law and Order fake out because uh, the 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 person who's accused of raping this woman has is, a perfect like is uh, played by the actor Julian Sands, and like just just uh, uh, look, look him up. Yeah, he's British. He's got one of those faces that just screams sex predator. Yeah, and uh, coincidentally uh, played a sexual predator in David Cronenberg's Naked Lunch. So there's a lot of a lot of baggage, and then you find out that this guy has made millions of flash freezing and destroying corpses, and you're like, well, this guy is. I, as I guilty sure as I they sure come. hope that doesn't come up again. <laughs> I, I love the idea that like people would be like, oh, this needs an IPO. Like everyone has yeah. this problem. I guess if you live in the <laughs> SVU world where like every other person is a serial killer, like it probably would be pretty valuable. But it just I, I don't see it as like a multi billion dollar company. There are a lot of there are a lot of like really wealthy scientist types in the SVU verse. Um like a lot of Elon Musk, but like really like niche, like designer babies. Um yeah, as you know, which is going to come in later in this episode. Okay, so they they visit uh, uh, Barclay Pallister at his um, his cadaver house. He denies that he had sex with April. He's married. You know, he's got his science. Women are coming out of the woodwork um, to steal his seed. Um, and he says he'll take a paternity test. The paternity test shows that uh, April is, in fact, pregnant with his kid. And this episode, well, I'm sorry, we're like an eighth of the way there. So, you know, the pacing is pretty brisk. Uh, he denies raping her, and then we're already at the trial. Um, April testifies, dressed like a prairie wife, that she was raped. She's very emotional. Um, and, and, you know, it comes out that April had called the defense attorney's law office just that morning offering to settle for $500,000. And Olivia is like, oh, well, uh, now, they, now they're not looking at you as a victim. They're looking at you as a, a cash cow or something. A gold something. digger. A gold digger. Um, and you know, April's like, Oh, you're mad. You're mad. I'm sorry. Um, and you know, Olivia is mad. Um, but she just says, just keep your eyes on me. She doesn't want to take the stand again. Olivia says, just keep your eyes on me. They really have a connection. It's kind of sentimental. Um, Olivia, the backbone for the victims. And then she's going to take the stand again the next day. She's not showing up in court. The call comes in. Where is she? Uh, she's not there. Um, her car has been found. Uh, it's gone off the highway. Huge flamey crash. Um, they assume, you know, her and the baby just vaporized. Interesting that they've been vaporized. Um, and Olivia. Who do we know that has up. a corpse vaporizer? <laughs> <laughs> Who do we know can vaporize bodies? Um, he, but even that is like dispensed with very quickly. And Olivia is beating herself up <clears throat> for pushing this victim too hard. Uh, then we go to, to Emmy Warner. Um, no body was found, and they're assuming that Pallister used his tech to vaporize her. And then, you know, th then we got to get Finch and Munch in there. Finn, Finch, Finch, <laughs> Finch, and, Finch and Munch. Finn and Munch in there. They're talking to her doorman. Turns out she was out to dinner with Pallister. Doormen are really, in New York City, are the unsung heroes of Law & Order. They provide alibis, um, you know, witty repartee. Uh, they find bodies on occasion. So, you know, big ups to the Dormans Union. And it turns out that the last call April made was to a guy named Roger, who was going to buy her baby for $50,000. So that's the running rate for a baby. And then, you know, it turns out she's promised the baby to three other couples. So not only did she take half a million dollars from Pallister, 
She's like, you know, ringing it up with all these families who, you all know. All these desperate couples who want to adopt a child. And she's playing all of them off against each other. Or like, none of them are aware of the other, the other couples who have been promised this baby. So like, she's just a straight up con artist. So you're getting, you're getting real bitch vibes. Um, Olivia's starting to get really mad about, oh, she's not a victim. She's, she's you know, she, I, she's taking me for a mark. And yeah, uh, Cragen in the squad room says she used the rape and the pregnancy to turn a quick buck. Which boy is that always happening today? What is Ice T said? He's like, if some if someone tricked me into fatherhood, I'd be pissed. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it turns out. So, oh, if somehow tricked me into fatherhood, I'd be pretty worked up. Yeah, I, I wasn't uh, gonna ag- do the agreed, voice. Agreed. Agreed. Um, it, so yeah, it turns out this woman is the greatest sperm jacker of all time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And uh, like, she has sperm jacked uh, Mark McGrath, Bobby Flay, some Giants player, Jesse Palmer. I mean, like they're not playing themselves; they're playing like fictional version of themselves, like the hot chef, downtown chef, like the cool rock star, and like the new third baseman for the Yankees or whatever. It's just like you want to talk about guest stars. They just like they get all these guys who just be like, yeah, like I met this crazy chick that I don't remember anything. So like then we get into like the real question of the show, which is. How do you sperm jack? Oh, she's, uh, it's revealed that she roofied all these guys. Yes. Like they all had one drink with her and then woke up with like nauseous and had no memory of the night before, which leads to the very yeah. important question. Goes, goes to Pallister. Elliot goes to Pallister and says, and she, Pallister says, if she slipped me a roofie, how did I get it up? And then it cuts to Warner in the, in the lab saying, the only explanation is a tech called electro ejaculation. And then it cuts to Finn doing like pursing his lips, doing a double take. <laughs> Uh, I don't like the sound of that. And she says, nothing to it. Insert this end into the rectum. An electric shock causes involuntary ejaculation. And John Munch says, love used to be simpler. <laughs> so a neat, neat little trick, a neat little tips and tricks out there for any listeners. I wonder, uh, how, I wonder is- how these like guest appearances were sold. To like Bobby Flay and like Mark McGrath. Hey, do you want to like get raped by a cattle prod? Like sort of playing yourself? <laughs> <laughs> well, Bobby Flay was married to Stephanie March at the yes, time. Oh, yeah, was. okay, okay. Um, and so, you know, there's so much subterfuge. It turns out then her mother comes on the scene. Played by Linda Carter. It's clear her mother's a con, but she blames her mom. The mother's first husband, April's father, uh, owns a sperm bank. And it turns out she was she was sperm jacking all these guys and then selling the sperm to her her dear old dad. Um, you He's know, like a eugenicist, like scientist who's trying to save the human race from like IQ degradation, played by Ronnie Cox of Total Recall and RoboCop. So this is a stacked guest star episode. Uh, you know, and the doctor was broke, so they're still thinking April's April's dead. He had a life insurance policy, blah blah. And then it's revealed April she's been alive this whole time, and she's looking hot as hell. And Olivia is very very mad with her, mad at her. Um, and April says the baby was stillborn. Um, Olivia's not buying that. Um, uh, she says, I was on your side when you were a rape victim, not a rapist. Um, so classic Law & Order SVU. Uh, are you a victim actually? Are you a rapist actually? And then a little role reversal. And there's some B.D. Wong stuff. You know, uh, uh, my mom taught me how to screw or be screwed. I'm too beautiful for prison. You know, she's kind of a Patrick Bateman, but with sperm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can't believe he liked Van Patten's sperm more than mine. <laughs> yeah. And then and then April is using the baby, like, is the baby alive or dead? That's her bargaining chip. Um, and she says, That's that baby's my ticket out of here. So Novak has to make a deal to give her no jail time in exchange for the baby. Turns out the mom has the baby. They were in on this the whole time, the two of these bitches. And uh, I'm, I'm using that as a direct quote. Uh, Olivia calls her a bitch, which is rare that Olivia says the B word, calls April a bitch twice in this episode. Uh, and kind of as, you know, um, uh, Olivia's holding the baby. You know, she's got a barren womb. She's, she's upset that NYPD is, is motherhood blocking her. <laughs> um, and then, you know, Pallister, the father, ends up with the baby. Um, you know, April doesn't give a shit. And kind of the the closing line of the episode is, I hear April's IQ is 170, and there's good genes on my side, too. She's perfect about the baby. So, you know, eugenicists uh, run the day. Watch out, watch uh, out, world. In In 20 years, there's another bad woman coming. (laughs) 
<laughs> <laughs> That's sort of the capstone to the episode. So I mean, like I, I think this is, this is a class, uh, as as Catherine said, like you know, there are episodes about sickos, and then there are episodes about bitch women, and women on SVU are either uh, victims or demons. Well, and yeah. sometimes they're a little combination of both, which is when the show gets a little uh, thorny. Yeah, that's when the show lately has tried to like sh- show its like sort of uh, learning and growing bona fides. Uh, when Olivia repeats her second favorite thing to repeat, her first favorite thing to repeat lately is that men can get hard even when they're raped. Curiously, she loves bringing that up lately. But <laughs> also, do love saying that there's no perfect victim. Olivia, that is Olivia. If there was an Olivia Benson action figure, that would be its catchphrase. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's no perfect victim mom yeah um i guess we'll uh we'll close out with my episode which is one of my all-time favorites um uh people who follow me on social media will have undoubtedly seen a three-second clip from this episode which i cannot stop posting of guest star jeremy irons saying the iconic line i I literally feel that i would die if i didn't have sex Season 12. Uh, Will, Will started using this line unironically <laughs> after we watched this last night. So This is a great episode. This is season 12, episode 13, Mask. So we start out classic SVU fashion. Scenes from New York City. We got <laughs> two boys just, you know, it's a sleepover. They're being bad kids. They're up too late. They're playing around with a, bu- a pair of binoculars that have a camera in them. No, don't you wish you had that when Paul Pelosi got <laughs> assaulted? <laughs> anyway, they catch they catch a smoking hot babe across way across in a building way a few blocks down, and they're oh, like rear window reference, yeah, rear window, a little rear window, and they're like, oh my god, she, oh my god, lady, she's oh wow, she's smoking, oh my god, lady, watch out, there's a guy with a mask, and this woman gets attacked, her partner comes in. Uh, the boys go, what? No, no, watch out. There's a psycho in there. She gets attacked too. Cut to the detectives on the scene. Uh, the blonde woman who the first caught the eye of the boys who, uh, Finn calls shutter bugs, who the boys, <laughs> the boys who just witnessed a horrific double rape. These two 11 year olds. Um, he was wearing a mask. Um, Finn has them hand over the binocular cameras to the PD um, they, uh, the, the blonde woman who was first spotted, she is in a coma. Her partner is not. It turns out that the blonde woman, she has a father, uh, and her father, <laughs> her father is Dr. Cap Jackson, an incredibly, <laughs> in, just a porn actor name. If I've ever heard incredible, one. incredible. Like it, it, so he is this highly influential sex therapist. He wrote a book about um, how, you know, sex addiction is real and you can overcome it and it's similar to 12-step recovery. And um, there's a little bit of a problem because they do this thing that happens in, you know, sort of post-season 10 where they go to the rape computer that they have in every SVU headquarters (laughs) and they type in, like, mask and they're like, wait, the mask that the kill, that the, you know, the rapist in our case used, it's been identified in like these three other cases, one in Virginia and one in uh, Delaware. And these are also places where Dr. Cap Jackson has, um, you know, sex addiction rehabilitation schools. Can I can I also say that like this felt like a little wish casting on the part of like some writer's behalf, like uh, just being like he cheated on his wife and being like, oh, look, it's on an episode. Uh, sex addiction is real. Um, <laughs> it's a real thing. Uh, lots of men suffer from it. Yeah, I feel like it's like, Every time Cap Jackson talks in this episode, every time I see Jeremy Irons, and he's in it from like the first scene, basically. Yeah. All I can think about whenever I see Jeremy Irons in this episode is that insane clip of him being interviewed yes. on the Huffington Post yes. where he's talking about gay marriage. This was like back in like 2006, 2008 or something like that. And he's just like, uh, uh, very, very good. I want everyone to love whoever they want to love. You know, marry your dog. Doesn't matter to me. I, I love is love. And he goes, but it does, it does, it does raise interesting legal questions. Like, um, I just worry about that. I mean, tax-wise is an interesting one because, you see, could a father not marry his son? Uh, Well, there are laws against incest. 
It's not incest between men. <laughs> Could a father not marry his son for tax purposes? And it's just like, wait a second. Could a father marry his daughter now for tax purposes? Of course not. What, like, how did you come up with this, like, this query about gay marriage, He man? was trapped in this so, role. He was probably trying to just avoid paying ca- taxes on his Irish castle or something. And he was like, mm, but what, if I, what if I married my son to avoid inheritance tax? So it's interesting you bring that up because the heart of this episode <laughs> is actually something quite similar. Cap Jackson has a history. He himself was a sex addict. So, you know, after they figure out that the masked attacker said that he would cure, uh, he, he, he would cure um, Debbie, uh, the victim of Falmouth, it turns out, when? 22 years ago, in a place called Falmouth, when Dr. Cap Jackson was in the midst of his alcoholism, alcoholism and sex addiction, he was on a family vacation. And ever since then, his daughter hasn't spoken to him. And Stabler and and Tutuola go to confront him. And after Jeremy Irons says the famous line, I thought I would die if I wouldn't have sex, it leads the detectives to go, wait, did you rape your daughter as he's going down (laughs) an elevator? It's begging the question. As he's going down an elevator? And he goes, "I, I, I, I don't remember. Oh, my God, I think I might have. (laughs) <laughs> brutal <laughs> just insane b- fucking brutal fucking brutal insane um so uh the working through the svu now is that the the rapist is using the mask of this hindu god of love and redemption and that his mo is to cure rape victims of their sort of impurity by raping them through a cleansing act uh the rapist stabs or the rapist attacks again, but this time the victim fights back and cuts him in the forearm. This is when the episode goes into turbo drive, and uh, <laughs> Stabler does. This is the second time Stabler has done this on SVU. Goes undercover in like a sex addict or sex offender rehab clinic. <laughs> Stabler loves going undercover, especially as like a sex maniac. And he, like, smuggles a phone in. It's implied that he stuck it up his ass. And he's on, (laughs) volunteers to take mop duty so he can snoop around. And then, of course, his good police work is interrupted by a stupid bitch, a woman who's addicted (laughs) to sex, who, like, you know, instantly is like, hey, are you a a cop? I used to screw entire precincts. You're the kind of guy I would (laughs) screw before recovery. And wouldn't you know it, she tries, she, like, you know, almost ruins the investigation by taking Stabler's phone in an attempt to seduce him. While he's trying to get it back, he runs into um, a guy who's very conspicuously covering up his forearms and rubbing them. And he he obviously finds that incredibly suspicious. The next day, they're in group, and he is face-to-face with Cap Jackson. Uh, After the session, Cap confronts him. Obviously, Dr. Cap is furious. He's like, (laughs) you are, you know, if word got out that there are police in my recovery groups, like, you know, you'd be you'd be endangering the recovery of so many of uh, of of of, you know, countless people. And Stabler's like, well, you know, you're we think that you are you may be harboring or maybe in the past you treated this mask guy. And so we need access. And there's this, you know, back and forth and back and forth. Until uh, finally, Cap kind of he 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 relents, and he's like, "Okay, you can work with us," but not before my favorite scene in the <laughs> entire episode, and maybe in SVU history. It's when the friend who is at Falmouth with Doctor Cap Jackson and his daughter at the incident many years ago. She's just coincidentally in the building. We've talked about the coincidences of people running into each other, right? Uh, how often it happens in SVU. She's just coincidentally in SVU headquarters. She runs into Dr. Cap, and Dr. Cap gets in a room with her and Stabler and Benson, and is like, please tell me, did I rape my daughter? And she goes, oh, no, actually, um, we were skinny dipping, and you were <laughs> drunk, and you you stripped naked and jumped in there, and your daughter left angry, and then we had sex. And he's like, oh, my God, did I rape you? And she goes, no, actually, it was awesome. And you were really good. And it was really fun. <laughs> and 
you were really good at sex. So, um, thanks, thanks for the sex. Yeah, so you, like, you, you, were, you, were, you were awesome. And it turns out that his daughter never spoke to him again because she was in love with the girl, the 17-year-old that Cap Jackson had sex with. And he, <laughs> she felt like he, he, he like drove her away. He, he won her back over to the dude's side with his awesome blackout <laughs> drunk sex. And uh, Felix, like when the, the, the daughter's friend, uh, she goes, that summer was really wild for me sexually. I did a lot of experimenting. And I don't regret <laughs> anything about it. It was great. And like at this point in the show, so like Dr. Cap Jackson has become the, the he's like Mr. Sex Addiction. Like he, like uh, B.D. Wong's character is like, I admire your work so much. Like we've, we've done, we've made great strides. In no sex addict left behind. Yeah, yeah, and, and recognizing sexual addiction is like, uh, like, a, like an actual pathology. So at this point in the show, Dr. Cap Jackson has spent 20 years, written a book uh, detailing every sordid affair in his life called like Eros Unchained. Or something <laughs> it is like called that. Eros Unchained, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's called Eros Unchained. All of it, based on this like uh this guilt that like he blacked out and like uh perhaps um uh, like yeah like assaulted his own daughter or like raped his own child and you know like that obviously you know if you're really dealing with that kind of guilt you've made your whole life about sexual compulsion and sexual addiction and how to how to treat and combat it then he finds out 20 years later it's like oh i didn't have sex with my daughter i merely had sex with her teenage friend how have I fucked up my life this bad over this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Men, his, men will, yeah, his daughter is in a coma, and like, but like, his daughter's in a coma and like dies by the end of the episode. And it's clear like the entire time she's gonna die, but like, all he cares about is like, oh, uh, w w was I good? Oh, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> men, okay men thank will, you. Men will literally go to sex addiction therapy to avoid talking to their daughters. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, he he's now he's now helping uh he's now helping SVU. Stabler um Stabler comes up with a great fucking way to get all the oh people my God. in the sex rehab to reveal their forearms. He goes, This is so weird. This is this so, is he's so like, weird. It's so fucking strange. He goes, My sex addiction is rooted in forearms. My <laughs> My 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 dad used to punish me by hitting me there, and and like you know whenever whenever I act up, I like pin a woman down by her forearms. It's so sexy to me. One time I snapped a woman's wrists, and what? And, and Doctor Cab Jackson goes, "What if we all pull up our sleeves and hug <laughs> Elliot?" <laughs> like I say, you know, forearms are my thing. Uh, we've seen how these male-only sessions can be helpful in father refiguration. So we, um, we all roll up our sleeves, right? And we show Elliot a little love, right? That's right. Come on, guys, roll up your sleeves. Give him a hug, shake him by the hand, do whatever feels natural. All right, brother. Okay. Felix, I did not get this at all. Is he saying he's turned on by men's forearms? It no, makes sex no group. sense. They're in a sex addiction group, and it's already been established that there's a modesty code, which means that all, all, like, everyone has to wear psychology. long sleeves. It's psychology. He's saying he's into women's forearms because his dad used to beat the shit out of him, and he would always know a beating was coming because he would roll up. The dad would roll up his sleeves, exposing his forearms. So then why does he make all the men in the group do the same thing? This is like sort of exposure therapy. Yeah, yeah. it's, yeah. it's kind of like, let's all be his daddy. And then like the, one of the other one of the other uh, sex sickos is just like, oh, I get it. We'll all roll up our sleeves. Come on, let's do it to support our friend Elliot, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Come on, let's see those arms. Yeah. And, the, and the, 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 the guy who was suspicious earlier, he's like, oh, no, there's a modesty code. And, and Dr. Cap Jackson goes, why don't you just help a fellow addict out? And... <laughs> Sure enough, he rolls him up. He, he just got a tattoo. Wrong sicko. But, okay, <laughs> remember that lost phone and the crazy bad woman? They call that phone. She's relapsed. And she relapsed by getting abducted by the mask guy. <laughs> Doctor, oh. Well, the, ma the mask guy, whoever it is, like uh, arranged a, a liaison posing as Elliot. Where, where he's like, oh, I'm Maybe not going to... at this abandoned Maybe cop an, bar. an abandoned cop bar. Yeah, yeah. You know, so very, you know it'll trigger her previous uh, addictions. Uh, dudes be like, I know a spot. Yeah. <laughs> and she's like, he calls her and she's like, Elliot, I'm, I'm waiting at the place that we uh, agreed upon. I can't wait to get my get my gangbang sesh going with you and the Manhattan SVU. Yeah, and it turns out it's this dude, Brett, who handles the database for the clinics. That's how he knows how to find these women. That's why he's like, followed this this uh pattern of doing it in places where there are these clinics 
Uh, they show up just in time. You know, Stabler disarms the sicko. Unfortunately, Cap Jackson's chain of rehab clinics goes under because he, they find out <laughs> that they... He's a complete they, uh, Oakum con artist. Yeah, yeah, he's a psycho moron, and he let a cop in. And they're like, well, what if you, you're you also B.D. Wong? What if you work for SVU? You're pretty good oh, at Oh, is this. that how he comes back? Yeah, yeah, they make him, they make him like Wong too, basically. He shows up in a few more episodes after this, after his happy ending is like, Oh, God, there's this psychotic episode where this, like, grandmother <laughs> molested both of her daughters, and only Cap Jackson has, like, the pervert's impulse to know that, like, <laughs> this good, this serial killer who's raping little girls is a woman. That's, like, one of his happy endings. Just one of the best characters ever in SVU. And this is, I mean, it's sort of, like, different as far as an SVU episode. It sort of goes off of the formula, but I still love this one. Probably my favorite... My favorite guest appearance besides uh, the very curious Isabel Huppert one. Oh, my God. <laughs> Who? H- Huppert. Or Hubert. Uh, uh, yeah. that, is, that is a great episode. Yeah, no, I mean, like, look, if you're going to, I mean, this is why I, I, I love the Jeremy Irons episode, because you're going to have a guest star on SVU. You better use the shit out of Je- him. Jeremy Irons is like, if you want a guy who gives off sex creep vibes, like, Jeremy, I mean, come on, like, we... We, we we did reversal of fortune on Chapo. Like the, he's the king of like I see weird sex weirdos. Yeah, daddy. I mean, yes. do, yeah, doctor. That girl said that Doctor Cap Jackson cured her of her bisexuality by showing her <laughs> how good how good drunk old man Dick can be <laughs> twenty years ago. <laughs> so there we go. That does that's our triumvirate of SVU episodes. Uh, and any closing shot thoughts on the uh, the meaning of this all? And um. Americans are such sickos. We yeah. are such a fallen country. Yeah. There's nothing left for us. There's there's no justice. There will never see heaven. This is what we like. We like stories about babies being raped and thrown in trash shoots. There's no redemption for us in this life or the next. Twenty one seasons going strong. <laughs>